broke and caught in the mosh pit The fuel to the fire, ain't nobody can stop it the Trouble in my city, but you know I'm across it Got a 40 on my hip and I'm liable to spark it Throw down these hits, my click is indivisible I aim, you duck, I squeeze, now you invisible I'm not afraid of getting physical All these different chemicals are fogging up my visuals Bloods on my hands, got slugs on my gunners Yo, we notorious, we ain't no runners Bloods on my hands, got slugs on my gunners Yo, we some warriors, they ain't called gunners Bloods on my hands, got slugs on my gunners Bloods on my hands, got slugs on my gunners Put on my sweat, put on the beat, put on the map, put on my team Take out every motherfucker in between, know what I mean? Better myself, better my aim, better my rap, better my name Killing rappers on my hang, I'm about to chase for the fame Never thought I would and now I'm running You don't wanna follow me, now I'm about to be in front of What's going on? What's going on? Peace and blessings And good morning, good afternoon, wherever you at Welcome to Steve the Kidney Nurse And a special broadcast of Kidney Disease Education Moment I am your host, Steve the Kidney Nurse. Man, it's been a while since I've been on live like this, but we have a great show today. Share this live, share this live. Uh oh, let me get my battery. All right, share this live, share this live. Anything can happen on the screen. All right, anything. So my computer was just about to die out. I'm recording live from TikTok as well. I uh, got my TikTok family in here. You see the phone aiming at the screen. I'm asking my TikTok family to share the video because we're going to get it popping. So without further ado, we're going to talk to, again, Moses Kennedy, the kidney ambassador from Kenya. It's about 8 p.m. East African time there now. So let me give Moses our, our special uh, guest uh, invitation. Here we go. Where is it at? That intro. Where is that? That special guest intro. Here we go. Moses, what's going on? Steve, it's been a while. Really yes, long time. It has. Yeah. Now, guys, it's going to be a delay because of the time difference and Moses is on a, a Bluetooth. So how you been, Moses? I'm good. Uh, I'm good. I'm good. I would say I'm good. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, so Moses... Um, you're in Nairobi, Nairobi, Kenya right now, correct? Well, uh, I'm in, in uh, up country at the moment in Kisumu, Kisumu, okay. Kenya. Yes. Now, how long have you been on dialysis? I've been on dialysis for five years uh, to date. So okay. possibly in my unit, I'm the longest uh, dialysis patient. Oh, you're the longest dialysis patient in your unit? Yes. Wow. Wow. I didn't know that as long as I knew you. I, I, didn't, I didn't know that. Now, Moses. Currently, um, yes. Now, how often is your dialysis treatments? Tell us about your dialysis facility. Um, well, first of all, you seen you see me in my videos how we have all these dialysis clinics here in the United States uh, in many communities. It's not like that in Nairobi. I mean, in Kenya, is it? Well, in, in Kenya, uh, renal treatment is completely different because here is a case where there are 
we are struggling and grappling with the uh, uh, lack of in infrastructure. And then uh, uh, dialysis, uh, renal uh, treatment is something that is still new. It is also developing in our country. So basically, uh, it's completely different, Steve. I know in the US or elsewhere in Europe, uh, dialysis, uh, uh, I mean, uh, renal treatment has undergo stages to a point that now they are at advanced level. Now in Kenya, it's different in so ways because number one, the government of Kenya still uh, do not give uh, renal treatment the much needed attention, okay? So that is where maybe we can begin from, all right? Because, okay. yes, because you realize uh, just three years back, the government of Kenya installed about uh, 47 uh, dialysis unit in each county. But I will say, you know, uh, we have uh, uh, we have bureaucrats in the government also who who undermine the the little effort that the government makes. Now you realize all these facilities existing in Kenya, they are not operational. In fact, the best and the most efficient operational, as per the standards here in Kenya, are private hospital and you know what private hospital comes with its share cost because it is private so that is the difference wow now the type of facility you go to is it private or ran by the government uh most of uh, we have about uh, about uh, 21,000 dialysis patients in, in the country. And uh, the government lacks the capacity to do, so uh, the private sector is really supporting and they are very efficient. But uh, guess what? What the government, uh, 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 Payment for NHF, that is the government insurer, mm -hmm. pays equal amount. So you, and vis-a-vis, uh, -vis, if you compare uh, uh, the service delivery vis-a-vis -vis, uh, uh, the money you being deducted, then you are left to, to wonder why the government hospital cannot provide good services. So at now, least major, majority of Kenyans will prefer private hospital. Right, right. Now, when you, you go to treatment twice a week. Yes, I get treatment twice a week, just like any other patient. Why, uh, not, the national why not three times a week? In the United States, they do three times a week. Why not in Kenya? Uh, in Kenya, the government doesn't uh, cut off for the third one. It says it is quite expensive. At the moment, the national insurer, that is the NHF, National Hospital Insurance Fund, they are out crying loudly that uh, renal uh, therapy replacement is consuming a third, almost a third of the total claims after inpatient. So you can see how the, it also reflects the, the growing number of yes. uh, 
of uh, a renal patient. Okay? So, by so giving us the third session, that is the reason they have. No, now they, they got good reason to deny us the third session. Mm -hmm. You understand? Yes. Yes, yes. Um, so you go twice a week for four hours? Twice a week for four hours. Okay. Now, are your medications included in the payment? Like if you need uh, epigen, which help build your red blood cell, is a medication that helps uh, the bone marrow produce more red blood cells. Or say if you need iron, because your iron goes low, do the government pay for that or you're responsible for that? Oh, yes. Steve, let me tell you, the, the National Hospital Insurance Fund really give us a basic package. It gives a basic package in the sense that it only cut us your walk-in to dialysis unit, your chin, your four okay. hours are unconsumed, you are out, next patient. So if you need other consultation or, or further, uh, uh, further, uh, further investigation, should you have some problems with your levels of, uh, of, uh, of uh, le uh, your chemistry, I mean, in your body, then you have to cut it out of your pocket. Personally, I've suffered, uh, I've been a victim for a very long time. Well, let me ask you this. Wait a minute. Yes. Okay, so here in the United States, the way, like, treatment is done is um, the uh, the doctor follows the patient right and he comes to the dialysis center and uh, you know they go over the labs and everything and if they think that the patient needs epigen or iron or whatever they'll write an order and then the clinic would administer the medication the nurse so you're saying that where in Kenya, the doctor doesn't come to the clinic to see you. You just go in, get your dialysis, and leave. Okay. No luckily enough, consultation and nothing. Uh, luckily enough, where I go to dialysis, the doctor come and see us every Wednesday. That is once a week. But then what happens if you need... Uh, EPO, uh, the blood boosters injection. Right. Uh, what happened? Or if uh, you need uh, an X-ray examination to check whether you have some uh, hydronephrosis, either in your kidneys or lungs, or I mean, name it. What will happen? You will have to dig, dig, dig deep into your pocket. So, so you're saying the patient is, is responsible? The, the patient is totally responsible. Other than dialysis, wow. yes. Other than dialysis, it's purely that. Oh, so if you need iron, like if your iron stores are low and you need, like you said, the blood booster, if you don't have the money, then you just don't get the medicine. And then you continue to... Your, your labs continue to just go critically low. Huh? Exactly. That is, that is, that is what is really threatening uh, patients, uh, uh, dialysis patients here in Kenya. And, because, and you said you've been a victim uh, of this? I've been a victim several. Up to the moment, I now have that. lost my strength. I've lost my strength. I cannot walk. But I thank God I'm still, uh, I can speak. I have my mind and brain. But I cannot walk. Yeah, I Already I'm deformed. Weak legs and hip joints because I cannot afford uh, 
uh, such drugs like iron and erythroprotein. Recently, I did my lab test. It came to 7.1 hemoglobin. So you can see. It's really, yeah, it's really, yes. It's a big challenge. And it's not Moses alone. I just represent the bigger portion of patients who really need these drugs. I understand elsewhere in Europe, they, they even expire. <laughs> hey, Moses, let me ask you. We had a question from, um, from TikTok. They want to know, do y'all have home dialysis or PD program? Peritoneal. Oh, no. That, it has never taken root in Kenya. It doesn't exist here in Kenya. It only, oh. yes, it doesn't exist. We only have hemodialysis. Do you think if they did PD that it would help home dialysis? Of course, it, it, will, it will really help because uh, the majority of patients are able to work and maybe have dialysis at night. You know, it will be a, a basically of advantage. If we introduce, uh, if 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 there are uh, home dialysis, so why they haven't come up with that concept yet? They trying to figure out who would pay for it. At the moment, they are not even thinking about it. Still, leave alone. Wow. They are not thinking about it. And, uh, you know, crazy. you know, sometimes when I go to, uh, to these forums, I speak about it. You realize uh, even the patient themselves lacks the knowledge that there's something that exists called home dialysis. So it becomes uh, a tedious and a long journey to make sense on uh, such things. But however, if, Man, if I'm, I'm, really... <laughs> no, I'm sorry. Keep going, Moses. Because you realize in the first place, the stakeholders has no idea of home dialysis. So you can see way backward still we have a long way to go. Yeah, man. I wish but they, I, wish I know was something it, I could do uh, to help mm -hmm. out over there. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Because, see, this is the thing that I have an issue with. Here in the United States, it's an overabundance of dialysis clinics and, you know, medication. You got a lot of waste usage and all that. And here we have another country where, you know, same uh, disease, but, you know, the way they're managing it is not really being effective or impactful. It's almost like the way you're making it sound like they're just kind of keeping you alive. You know, you know, you go in, get your treatment and leave any type of consultation or you need any epigen, which is a medication that helps the bone marrow produce more red blood cells, or if you need an iron shot, or if you need a um, phosphorus binder, or uh, uh, medicine like Zemplar, which helps control the PTH, then you're on your own. But here, Medicare pays for it, you know, and the thing about it. Like you said, Moses, how um, next to inpatient dialysis takes up a lot of the NHIF um, uh, budget. Same with Medicare. Dialysis is uh, in stage renal disease is takes up a big portion of, of, of the Medicare budget. And these companies see the profit and along with uh, private insurance. Um, let me tell you something, man. On TikTok, I did a duet with a young lady who um, presented her bill. And it was over $5,000 for, 
for one treatment. $5,000. $5, yes, $5,000 for, for one treatment. So if they go three times a week, um, it's almost up to sixteen, seventeen thousand 17,000 um, per week, per week. And so here, these companies see this, they take advantage of the illness here. Diabetes and hypertension are the two leading causes of, of kidney failure, kidney disease. And, you know, there's no education, real education, I feel like, or, or prevention, because if it were, you wouldn't have this many people and, and, and clinics being built. And now, so, oh, man, how, how many I chairs you. do your facility has, Moses? How many treatment chairs? Uh, when, when I first started dialysis in that uh, facility, well, I've been to dialysis other facilities, but my current facility, when I joined that facility, there were only three, three chairs. Whoa, 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 whoa. Today, three chairs? There are 29. As I speak, there are 29. So you went so from three So you can see how this it is money-making. Yes. Yes. In a span of two years, wow. it, is, it has moved to 21. So and, and Moses, still, Tomer's plan, how does that work? Sorry? The transplant, it, it has to be a relative, correct? Talk about the transplant and, and how they do transplant over in Kenya. Okay, uh, in Kenyan setup, uh, the transplant process is still just still uh, in its process of development. Just as I have mentioned, renal uh, treatment as a whole is still uh, uh, undergoing development. So you realize that uh, when it comes to transplant, you are limited the options of having donor, you are only limited to... Why is that? The reason being that we do not have the right legislation to govern this. Okay? There could be, there could be some uh, black trade in between that might happen uh, or, or uh, organ trafficking so, which also plays a vital role anyway, given the, given, uh, the state here in Kenya, because if the government tend to argue that if we open up that anyone, anybody can donate to you, then that concept of monetary value will creep in, okay? Well, you know what? It's, it's uh, ironic that you say that because in Iran, Iran is the only country that allows a person to uh, sell their organs. And they have a system in place where they pay the donor $4,600, you know, equivalent to $4,600. And they do the tests and they match the person up. So the person gets... Um, you know, a, a compensatory, um, you know, payment for their organ, and then the person life is saved and it's being controlled. You know, but yes, you're you're right. It can be some back alley stuff that comes along with that. But since the '90s, that's when Iran started it. Since then, they had done more than thirty thousand transplants that way. So, but over in Kenya, you have to be a relative to transplant, correct? Yes, absolutely a relative to to to, to transplant. And yeah, imagine a pocket. scenario where where a kidney disease runs in the family. What happens? Right. When it marks your roadblock. So let me if, ask you: if if yes. you have uh, someone to donate in your family. 
who pays for that? Do you have to pay for it or the NHIF pays for that? <clears throat> NHF pays only a quarter of the total cost of transplant. So the rest comes out of your pocket. Even the medication? Exactly. Even medication. Oh my God. That is why I don't even advise people to go for transplant simply because after transplant, who will take care of the medication? They end up going back to dialysis just in a month, in, in three months' time. They end up going to a dialysis. I've had fellow warriors who did successful transplant, but then because of the medication, they end up going back to dialysis and then completely losing hope and losing it all. It, it, it almost sounds like a vicious cycle. It's, it's not easy. For transplant, it comes with a lot of challenges. And that is what most of our nephrologists or transplant team here in Kenya do not really, uh, do not really uh, share with their patient. Yeah, that's... Okay? Yeah. You can have... go all the process because you can even have a one-time fundraising and have... Okay. A successful transplant. Now, would you do a fundraising every day? Oh no, people will get tired of you. It is human nature. So you better struggle right, with so the dialysis. You pretty much got to be wealthy. You pretty much got to be wealthy. Yes, or supportive relatives, or friends, or maybe a sponsor. Yes, that is why you see the death rate is so high, it is just within the first two years, you get into dialysis, that is the life expectancy, two years, you get into dialysis and then you die. Why? Because in initial years or weeks or months, you will have all the support system at your disposal, but when that support system realized that, hey amen, the journey is far from now. Then they give up. Once they give up, you also give up and you die. You know the expectancy rate. You miss dialysis two weeks, you know what will happen of potassium. Wow. So it's not easy. It's not easy. That is why I was telling you um, the longest. Perhaps this is being attributed by uh, maybe I'm also trying to, to get as much as possible to know about my condition. It has helped me a lot. Right. But what, what can we do over here to help? What, what, what could be some suggestions from you that we can help either you and some kidney warriors from here to, to manage? I mean, say, for instance... Now, okay. I, I have uh, already, uh, I have a prepared uh, suggestion that, but let me just highlight sure. a little bit. Yes. But I have a well, a presentation that uh, can, uh, can, can work it out. But let me just highlight number one, that uh, we can help Kenyans who are undergoing this trouble is uh, to assist organization create awareness. So by creating awareness, it means uh, the organization that do education, okay, get the good incentives so that they can even cr create serious campaign and awareness yeah. that can give the government pressure mm -hmm. to at least have to know that, hey, there is loud noise here. Let us wake up. Number two, I would suggest that uh, maybe because I've talked to several warriors, maybe through TikTok and elsewhere, 
and they are telling me that things like uh, uh, post transplant med they have it abundant to the extent that they get expired recently uh, i donated some uh, i donated some uh, uh, transplant med to another patient then i realize it can really help a lot maybe if those that are about to expire we can make use of them here and reduce the cost of purchasing those drugs for transplant patients mhm mm yes um let me ask you some let me get back to this and uh so um far as with medication is is the epigen and that medication expensive there if you paid out of pocket it's, it's expensive it is, is that expensive. something you can get on the black market no you can't get it on a black market in fact uh, local pharmacies do not dispense it you only buy it from uh, established hospitals the high cost hospitals like aga khan those are private hospitals that is where it's available because it's rarely used so if an ordinary pharmacy or uh, uh, stock it then definitely the pharmacy or the business enterprise will incur losses because not everyone will buy it that is why it is expensive so that has made the supply of that drug a very rare commodity right yes right yes. no I, uh but steve is, is it true uh, it's abundant in the us to the extent that they expire some expire without being used yeah i mean and but is they're getting more tight and controlled in administering these type of medicines because it's expensive here uh, okay. That's why here they do something called anemia management. And a lot of patients that go to these clinics uh, don't know about this. And basically with anemia management, they do hemoglobins. Uh, they draw blood twice a month, hemoglobins. And they follow their hemoglobins and, hem and, and hematocrits. And based on the numbers, like if your hemoglobin is like 10 to, or maybe say 11 to 12, they're not going to give you any uh, epigen. All right, they're going to stop it and wait till that number decreases and then they restart it. They have certain ranges where they increase it by 25% or they decrease it. And so um, it's kind of playing up and down with the patient's hematocrit. But at the same time, if you have someone that is really watching what they're doing and um, keeping track of their hemoglobin and you know their blood loss and all that, it is it's great. But at the same time, here, that's what they do with the epigen and how they um, decide what dose is based off the hemoglobin numbers and and they titrate the dosage because they know it's expensive they're not going to keep giving you one dosage for you know for like say if your if your hemoglobin goes up to between 11 and 12 and don't quote me on this but between 11 and 12 and if you're getting 5,000 units they're going to either decrease that or hold the EPO until that number starts to drop down. And so that's why they do the hemoglobin lab draws twice a month. But if you don't have a nurse there, a lot of these units now, they're short staff. And so if you don't have a nurse or someone to monitor that, um, you know, usage can be you know, abundance. But at the same time, you had asked me about the expiration. And yeah, they're not going to 
The only way we that does happen is like if someone's at a nursing home dialysis unit, because they do dialysis in nursing homes here. And if you have a patient that has their own epigen and we keep it in a refrigerator, right? Because they may not use the uh, medication that the dialysis center has. And if that patient happens to go into the hospital or pass away, that epigen is still in the refrigerator. You see what I'm saying? And they may use it for someone else, but it does have an expiration date on there and they are mandated once it goes past that expiration date to throw it away. They have to, because they have, um, you know, inspectors that come not all the time, but every year, but that's all guided through the state and, and, um, uh, when they do the inspections, but yeah, they throw those medications away if it expires, but some of them could possibly, I know someone at a hospital that used to take, uh, it was a doctor. They gave him expired medicine and he used to go overseas. Uh, he worked at a um, medical place, you know, kind of that was impoverished that needed these medications. And some of them are still good if you never pop that, um, the cap off of it. So I think a lot of times we waste a lot of supplies, even with the dialysis tubing. It's the same thing. If the tubing uh, or the dialyzer, the filter, it's, you know, if it's, if it's the expiration date tomorrow, they may still use it if they don't realize it or they do realize it, they may throw it away. But, you know, it's, it's a fine balance. It's a fine balance depending on what company you work for. But they're not going to tell you outright, um, you know, saving supplies and costs. I get you. Yeah. I get you clearly. Yes. Yeah. So, I mean, we had a lot of comments on, from TikTok that that they say um, DD, DTC uh, donated her extra Valporo uh, to someone. And uh, another comment from uh, Homie97 uh, mentions that the hospital is trying to control uh, the dialysis over there. Do you feel that way? That they trying to control it and and make a profit off of it. What are your feelings about that? Of course, yeah. Just like uh, it does happen globally, I guess, still. Even uh, in the US, the bigger dialysis companies, they're out of profit. So uh, say, likewise to Kenya, it is not exceptional. And they are also out to make a profit. But mm-hmm. now the appetite, I'm talking about here, the appetite in Kenya is so high for profit making to be to be precise. Well, let me ask you this, Moses. Do you get services yes. such as dietary, like able to talk to a dietitian or oh, social no, worker? No, no. That's no, what no, they no, have no. here at the clinics. No, 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 no. If at all you know you are supposed to see a dietitian or a social worker, then you will seek those services elsewhere, privately. Come on, Moses. Are you serious? In fact, even, even, even just a follow-up before even you fall to uh, stage five and stage chronic kidney disease. You know, even the doc, uh, the system that operates here in Kenya uh, makes you unaware that uh, you need to prepare so that one day you can even delay the progression or stop it. 
that thing in between does not exist. Something uh, I don't like to call it uh, predialysis, but let's say predialysis. Because you go see a nephrologist, uh, one appointment, you pay a lot of money for consultation fee. He tells you to come tomorrow or a week later. You don't have the consultation fee. You disappear. You go on without that advice. So you progress so fast. You progress so fast. Wow. So nothing like that. The package constitute of, let me quote, walk-in dialysis, two sessions a week, and doctor's consultation. Yes, then yeah. there is uh, lab works once a month, period. So the service for dialysis is you, the physician dialysis twice a week for four hours and the monthly labs. Anything outside of that, you got to pay for it. Out of your pocket. Oh, my God. Oh, that no. <laughs> Wait a minute. <clears throat> so how do... Like these patients at the dialysis clinic get um, dietary consults. How, how are they knowing about what to eat and what not to eat? I mean, do some of them do pay out of pocket? But I'm just saying the average person, how do they know what to eat, what to avoid? Do they get some type of list of foods to avoid? I mean, how would they know? Uh, you know, most, you know, we are really in a pathetic state because what is really what is really is of our advantage is lack of awareness you remember here in kenya almost 99 percent of patients who are diagnosed end stage kidney disease do not know anything about dietary their condition, name it, anything they do not know. And they can stay on dialysis and you will realize their health deteriorates so fast because in the first place, they do not know what to eat and what to avoid. So maybe for a few uh, a few a few families that the support system works. Uh, one, if a doctor says, "Let's go and see," you need to see uh, because the doctor will give you a prescription. The doctor will tell you, "Go and see a nutritionist," or see uh, uh, this specialty. And he leaves. He doesn't do a follow-up. It is up to you. The reason why they also don't do a follow-up, they don't ask you why, why you, you never, you've never gone to, to do such request. They, I mean, such investigation or referrals they made is because they know that you cannot... So... Most patients, they lose it in the first two years of dialysis. Mm. They lose it. They lose it. They lose it. Basically, as I speak, those, my current dialysis, those who I started off with, are all gone. I only see two, three people, about two, three people familiar. All are gone. Mm. Yes. So it is not easy. Steve, it is not easy. I'm sure. I'm this sure. What made you educate struggling. yourself, Moses? What What made Sorry? you want to be the What made you want to be a kidney ambassador to educate? I mean, how did you get to this point, Steve? Uh, I used to question so many things about myself because I was wondering. Today, the doctor says, "Do not take water." Next day, he says, you should take enough water. The next time somebody tells you, 
you should not eat uh, this. You should not eat protein. The next day, somebody tells you, you need protein because you are on dialysis. So I wanted to get authentic knowledge. I realized that that challenge that I've been grappling with, grappling with, I should share and awaken fellow warriors, those who were at the same state that I was before I started, uh, immediately after I started dialysis. So it's about knowing too much is what has helped me. It's about knowing too much. Right, right. Yeah. Um, why, Moses, why, why do you think um, more Kenyans that deal with this kidney disease are not out speaking out like you? Why have why are there not more uh, advocates like say here in the United States where you have people? I'm sure that you see from where you're at the different because I see you commenting on the different kidney shows and the education shows. This one and and other ones. Um, why do you think Kenyans with uh, kidney disease are not being more proactive, such as yourself? Uh, one thing, uh, Kenyans, I want to generalize for this matter. When they become sick, especially uh, chronic diseases, maybe not only kidney disease, but maybe cancer and other chronic uh, related diseases, uh, there is a lot of stigma. How will people perceive you in the society? What of your status? Okay. Are you going to lose friends? Uh, in fact, it is funny if, if you are married, like myself, they will tell you, are you going to lose your wife to mm -hmm. another man? Yes. You see, so there are so thing many things. Say. Sorry? Now say, that's a horrible thing to say. To someone come on Steve no I was just saying what you just said about someone asking you are you going to lose your wife to another man I'm saying that's a horrible yes. thing to say oh yes oh yes it is it is it is so there is a lot of stigma and, and so they don't want to be out there number one number one is kicking out that stigma. Exactly. So let me the, ask you this. The stigma can be kicked just through education and awareness. So we had talked, how can we get education like these shows um, into clinics or for more Kenyans that deal with this disease to watch it and see that other people um, are dealing with this disease in other places as well. Steve, uh, it's a very good question anyway. You know, education for kidney disease can only work on, uh, on physical infrastructure. There has been a challenge because by physical structure, I'm referring to uh, going to the people directly. Say like, the, that is my approach. Basically, I've been doing that. Going to your church, you begin with your church, where you fellowship. And then you proceed on to schools and other institutions so that you walk directly and deliver message directly physically. Yeah. Because you realize the people who are supposed to watch this, the people who are supposed to watch and to get knowledge from this, our advocacy online, they are consumed on uh, entertainment industry. So if you are not a, if you are not a comedian, then uh, you don't even get followers. Steve, let me tell you, the Figo Initiative is doing great. 
to get awesome. such a following. It is small, but it is not easier because it is not comedy. It is serious matters. So the best thing I see sometimes when I post serious message on, on online, then sometimes you don't even get a single like. But you, I know deep from my heart, I've done something great. That is why I was talking about a physical infrastructure that we get to reach people directly in the community. As if that is not enough, let me tell you still that most of these patients, majority of them, are also illiterate. A number of them are illiterate. So if you take that message in their local language, it is something they will relate with. You know, we have even faiths here in Kenya that they say us, we cannot watch uh, things online because those staff are adulterated, such like things. So those are the challenges. In, uh, have you been able to use the education material that I sent you? Has that been helpful? Actually, I've been using that all my time. I've been using that. Okay, I can send you more. Um, you know, because we got to get this message out there to our fellow Kenyans that are dealing with kidney disease uh, to show them that they're not alone. Um, here in the United States, more than 700,000 people are, um, are dealing with end-stage renal disease, uh, doing some type of uh, and you know, it's just the list is growing as you see with the facilities that are being continuously built uh, with no patients inside, excuse me, no staffing, but they still decide to build these clinics. And these companies, they can leave these, these buildings sitting here for a while because normally they're normally here in the United States, um, impoverished neighborhoods that are really hit with a lot of facilities. And so, um, you know, just the mismatch of, of, of services between here and where you're at is just unbelievable where you can't even get three hours of treatment, you know, like three, you know, three hours, three times a week where uh, here, the average person may, I don't say the average, but you got people that run two and a half hours twice a week, but they still got urine output. Or they may run three hours, three times a week. That's nine hours of treatment a week. With you, that's eight hours twice a week. I mean, it, it's just, it just doesn't make any sense. I mean, I know what it comes down to. I'm, you know, I know what it literally comes down to, but it just doesn't make sense. Just like with the transplant list here in the United States and where you're at, it got to be a relative and, you know, I mean, we can keep having it's, these conversations. It's, it's but completely different. It's completely different. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, what I hope to, to gain from these uh, conversations and, you know, my advocacy is to bring more awareness to this disease, uh, bring more awareness to um, these large clinics coming in communities next door to establishments that kind of cause the disease in the first place. I'm going to say cause, but one of the cause and effects, like diabetes and hypertension, you know, the things that contribute to these diseases like um, high sodium processed food, saturated fat, high cholesterol and st stuff like that. And when you don't know anything and you got a dialysis, you know, dialysis clinic right next to a family dollar or a place that's unhealthy and you're not on dialysis and you don't even know 
that you have hypertension or diabetes, but you you're at risk and you're consuming your diet and just other factors. Next thing you know, two, three years later, person is in the emergency room being diagnosed for renal failure and they don't got far to go because they is run right there in the neighborhood. I mean, you know, they put it together. Like I've been going to the family dollar for so long. And next thing you know, they on dialysis and the clinic is right next door to it. I mean, like, let me ask you in Kenya, I know it's not the United States, but where are mostly these dialysis clinics located? Are they in um, neighborhoods or medical centers or shopping areas? Where would they be located in Kenya? Uh, initially, it started, uh, uh, they were first uh, located in, uh, in uh, facilities, medical facilities. Okay. But, but as, as, as I've said, as appetite rose, for making profit, the dialysis units have been opened in in places like shopping malls. Wow! Even in Kenya. Even in Kenya. Wow! And they they at least they will get they will get a a, a patient. Right, right. Somebody yes. commented on uh, that's sprawling all over nowadays. They're sprawling all over, right? Right, if somebody commented on TikTok, the hospitals in most uh third world countries is not as privatized as in the U.S. That's clear, but you're saying now in Kenya, they're starting to see the appetite for the profit, so they're starting to see that and starting to branch out in, in communities kind of like similar to here. Uh, yes. You know. So is there those, one who stay, those who stay in uh, up countries have to travel and get somewhere for accommodation or you need now to stay close to that facility. They are only in urban right. centers. That is where they are targeting their a client. Mm. All right. Well, we're down to the to the last hour. I know it's uh, nine o'clock where you're at. Uh, when do you go back to dialysis, Moses? Uh, a Tuesday. Tuesday. So you go Tuesday, Tuesday and, and Friday. Saturday. Huh? Tuesday and Friday. So you go Tuesday and Friday. Yes, Tuesday That's and interesting. Friday. Yes. That's interesting. And I'm sure initially, you're very... Hmm? Initially, I used to do it uh, on uh, on uh, on Wednesday, Saturday. Wow. Wednesday, Saturday. So that's three days apart. Well, from yes. Wednesday to Saturday is three days, and from Saturday to Wednesday is is four days, correct? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, man. So, you know, we're going to do all we can here to help you and our fellow Kenyans with education, prevention, any material. Um, I, I mean, even, you know, we got to bring you back to talk about the FIGO initiative, your nonprofit. Um, because that's that's another show in itself, and how you know through your nonprofit of uh, what you do, how we can help Kenyans uh, with medication that's on dialysis that may need you know binders or something that can start from somewhere. You know what I'm saying, Moses? Start from you know somewhere you. with binders or something. Um, yes. Because this is not right. It is not right. Yeah. So, Moses, before we go, 
Uh, I'm going to put you solo and give you about a minute or two of what you want people who's watching to know about uh, dialysis in Kenya and what you're trying to do to uh, raise awareness, your final thoughts. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and put you solo and give it to you right now before we get off. Thank you very much, viewers. My name is Moses Kennedy, your kidney ambassador. I'm uh, the founder and executive director, the FIGO Initiative. Now, if you really care for your health and you want to know what your kidneys are, go to my page, the FIGO Initiative. Like it and share. That's Thank it. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, awesome. So, uh, Moses, um, I really appreciate you uh, taking the time. Like I said, I know it's 9 o'clock p.m. where you're at. Yes. 9 um, o'clock my time. I'm, I'm sure as I'll let you get back to your family. I thank you for um, taking the time out this hour to speak with us and letting us know what's going on with dialysis in, in Kenya and everything else that you discuss it pertaining to the NHIF and transplant, man. It's really been a great conversation and I look forward to bringing you back very, very soon, possibly next week. We're, we'll get our dates uh, in sync and talk about your organization and how, you know, we can help you help fellow Kenyans that deal with this disease. Thank you. I'm looking forward to that. Let's have another show next week. Okay. I'll talk to you soon, man. You take care. Okay. Thank you. Sir. Okay. Sounds good, Moses. So you take care of yourself, man, and I'll talk with you soon. Have a great day. All right, you too. Thank you. So, guys, this has been uh, an incredible... Sh Wait a minute. Why am I not being seen? All right. All right, guys, this has been an incredible show. Um, I mean... The things you heard that Moses told you is unbelievable. And, you know, kidney disease is all across the world. Different places deal with it in, in, in different ways. And this is how they deal with it in Kenya. So I uh, thank you for watching the show. Um, you know, Moses made a comment that I agree with him. Uh, where he may post some great information and only get one like. Well, I, I used to, uh, when I first started and I put out information, and even now sometimes when I feel like it's great information and nobody's liking it or seeing it, I'm sure people are seeing it. Maybe they might not like it, but as long as that information can reach one person, okay? I used to say that and then, used to say, oh, no, we got to reach more than one person. But if one person can benefit from the information that's put out there, whether it's one or nobody likes it, but they see it and they read it, I mean, then you did your job, just like me. So uh, thank you guys. I'm going to probably stay on TikTok for a couple of minutes. But I want to end this show and just like to thank everyone for tuning in. And we will be back. I uh, just don't know when on a weekly basis uh, to do shows to, you know, get this education out there like I've been doing. So see you guys later. Uh, thanks for joining me on Facebook, Steve, the Kidney Nurse, Urban Health Outreach Media, and uh, all other platforms we're on. Before I leave out, going to do the uh, one of our... Um, uh, 
production, uh, education videos that was produced by Urban Health Outreach Media. See you guys later. God bless. Now I gotta ride or die